Happy Easter, my Black Hawk family. Have you found some hope yet this morning? God is so good, so good. So glad that you're here. If you're a guest with us, I just want you to sit back, relax, know you're among family today, that you are loved today. And I want to welcome all of you to this Easter Sunday. This is my favorite Sunday of the whole year. Because if that was not for the fact that Jesus is no longer in a tomb, but that he is alive, then we would have no hope. But because he's alive, we have every reason to hope. You have every reason to hope today. And I want to welcome all of you. We have a big extended family. This is the second of two services today. We baptized 13 people today. God has been moving. People are finding hope. I want to welcome you if you're watching us online today. If you're part of our extended family, watching us at home in your pajamas, on television, online, whatever that looks like, thank you for joining us today. I love that we have such a big family, and it's because it's all a part of the family of God. We welcome you to it today. I want to talk to you today about holding on to hope. Holding on to hope. Have you ever felt hopeless? You ever found yourself searching for hope in a world that feels hopelessly broken? I'm well aware that some of you came in today. It's Easter Sunday, and you may have come because grandma or grandpa or mom or dad drug you here, and you had a drug problem. I always say I grew up with a drug problem. My parents drug me to church, whether it was Sunday or Wednesday, no matter what day it was. Maybe you got drug here today and you're here and you're just wondering, what is it that I can latch on to in a place like this? Maybe you've given up hope in some way. Today I pray from the depths of my heart and I look into your soul, not because I have anything to offer you, but because he has everything to offer you today. There is hope. I want to talk about how we hold on to that hope. If you've got your Bibles Look at 1 Peter. Toward the end of your Bibles, you might start at the end of your Bible and go back from there. Maybe the quickest way to get there. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 wants to look at how we can hold on to hope from 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Verses 3 through 9. I was looking at hope for several weeks here, and you've noticed there it's lit up behind me here. And there's a lot of ways that the Bible uses hope. Hope is in the Bible over and over and over and over again. But there's a common denominator. If you try to define that word hope, the common denominator is this word expectation, expectation. And I want to give you a couple of definitions of hope as we see it in Scripture, and it's the desire for some good with expectation of obtaining it. Anybody want something good today? You say, I hope the preaching's okay. I don't want to go to sleep on Easter. I hope something good happens today, and I have the desire to obtain it. Another one, a looking forward to. In confident expectation. In 1 Peter 1 and 3, we're going to take that a step farther. And it's not just hope, it's living hope. You'll see it in just a moment. Living hope. The word living means this, in an absolute sense and without end. I love that. I love that because not only do we get to have hope, we get to have something to look forward to with confident expectation. We get to have something to look forward to with our expectations pertaining to the future with confidence in it never, ever ending, in an absolute sense, a living, alive, never ending hope. That's what you have available to you in this place today. Some of you found it, some of you are searching for it, but no matter where you are, this living hope that we're gonna look at today is at your fingertips. Look there with me, 1 Peter chapter one and verse three. Who's ready for the word today? Our desire every week at Black Hawk Ministries is to let the Word have the Word. The Word gets the last word. It doesn't matter who stands in this pulpit. We want God to speak to us because what I know about me is I'll let you down. I'll let you down. Look at somebody. Whoever you're looking at, they'll let you down. The person you brought, they'll let you down. Can I get an amen? Don't say that. Don't do it. Don't do it. But the Word will never let you down because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Love this Easter verse for us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a, say it with me, living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Happy Easter to you today. We have a living hope because Jesus has risen. He is alive. Let me give you a definition of hope. We've already looked at it, but here's the definition we'll use today. Anybody wondered, what's the deal with all the umbrellas? 
Well, this is going to start to make a little bit of sense to you today because I think hope is really this. Whatever it is, and if you've got notes, you've got some notes as you came in. You can take notes through our app. You can access the Bible there, whatever works easiest for you. You can take notes on your notepad, or you can just act like you're taking notes and nobody will know the difference. Whatever works for you. Write this down, though. Hope is whatever it is that covers your expectations for the future. Whatever it is that covers, covers your expectations for the future. Ever heard of an umbrella policy in insurance terms? An umbrella insurance policy is there to cover whatever your other coverage won't cover. It's a safety thing. It, it alters your experience of the bad times in your life. Now, I've been told, and if you open umbrellas in the, in the church or in any building, the, it's, it's what? Bad luck. You know what? If you, don't, if you believe that, you're in for bad luck today because I don't believe in luck at all. I know the maker of the heavens and the earth, and he doesn't do anything based on luck. So with that said, <laughs> nobody left. All right. We're all staying. Good. An umbrella. You ever notice what they do? It alters your experience of the rain, doesn't it? It changes how you experience the rain. It covers. You expect rain's going to come because Curtis told you it was. And so you get an umbrella so that you can alter how you experience the rain. But one thing about umbrellas is they can't stop the rain. Have you ever seen an umbrella that made the forecast change? No. An umbrella just alters how you experience the rain. Hope is the same way. Hope does not mean your life and all of its pieces are going to come back together. Hope doesn't mean that your life's going to be perfect. Hope doesn't mean that all of your problems turn into perfection. Hope changes how you walk through the rain and the struggles and the problems in your life because you see them through a new lens. Hope is whatever it is that you hold on to to cover your expectations about the future and whatever the future might hold in your life. Just like an umbrella, just like an umbrella insurance policy. It covers what a lot of times we think can't be covered. I love this picture for Easter Sunday because to me the ultimate hope of Christianity, the ultimate hope of our faith is celebrated on Easter Sunday. We talk about how Jesus, yes, he died. We celebrated through a Good Friday services a couple of days ago. The fact that Jesus died on the cross. And we talked about why is Good Friday good? It was a bad Friday. Jesus died. He was brutally beaten. If you look at the story, you look at the history of crucifixion. He went to the cross with no skin on his back, with his bones, with his ligaments exposed, bleeding, dying as he carried his own cross as the son of God with no reason to do so except for your face being on his mind. It was a bad and dreary and dark Friday, but Friday that's bad becomes a good Friday when we look at it from Sunday's perspective because Friday ended on Friday night, then came Saturday, and Sunday came, and Jesus is alive. He's not in a tomb. As a pastor, I get asked this question a lot. What's so different about Christianity? What makes Christianity different from all these other religions? I'm well aware you have a lot of avenues for your faith. Religions are everywhere. What's so different about Christianity? And I could give you a lot of different answers, but I want to give you two. The first is what we just talked about, resurrection. Resurrection. What makes Christianity so different? Resurrection. If you go down any other path, there are people that are the face of all these religions, and people commemorate and celebrate and worship at times those people in a tomb. But my God's not dead. Oh, if you visit his tomb, he's not there because he's risen. And he's seated with God in heaven, and he's inside and around and among us through his Holy Spirit. What makes Christianity so different is the fact that Jesus is alive, and we don't go to a tomb to worship our God. I'm glad of that. I'm glad of that. The second thing I think that makes Christianity so different is grace. Somebody say grace. Grace, grace, God's grace. Mm. I love the grace of God because here's the difference in Christianity and all these other religions. Any track you take for your faith is going to lead to you reaching out to God, trying to find a way to reach him, to get a hold of him, to be good enough to get there. But Jesus came and he rose from the dead and offered to you grace and where now it's not about you reaching God, it's about God reaching down to the depths of your sin and your despair and your lack of hope and your lack of purpose. It's about God reaching down and picking you up and meeting you where you are. 
That's what sets Christianity apart. That's what sets Jesus apart today, just so you know. So let's talk about how I can hold on to hope. Here's the question of the day. How can I hold on to hope in a world that feels hopelessly broken? Have you noticed that about our world? If you haven't, look around a little today. It'll start to feel a little hopeless. It'll start to feel a little bit broken. So how can we hold on to hope in a world that feels hopelessly broken? I'm well aware in a room of this size, some of you came in and you've lost hope. You've lost hope in relationships, perhaps. You tried to salvage a relationship and it ended. You lost hope in people. Maybe you lost hope in the church. I found that at churches, people go there. (laughs) And when people are present, pain happens. Messes are made. People are messy. Look at somebody say, you're messy. That was your chance. You didn't even take it. Okay, we'll move on. Just so you know, you, some of you just met me. I preach way better if you talk to me, way better, just so you know. Now, some of you lost hope in people. Some of you lost hope in the church, but here's what I know about you. Some of you have lost hope in faith. Some of you have lost hope in God. Some of you have lost hope in Jesus. My goal today, my agenda, I want to lay it bare before you, is to convince you otherwise. Not because I'm so good, but because Jesus has already won a victory. And because he's so good, and his hope is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's offering it to you, even in your hopelessness, even in your brokenness today. So how can we hold on to hope in a world that's hopelessly broken? I believe, I know somebody's leaving this place. Hear me, somebody's leaving here today knowing what it means to hold on to hope even though you feel hopeless. Somebody's leaving here today with the hope of eternal life in Jesus. You came not knowing him. You came not knowing you have a personal relationship with God through Jesus. Somebody's going to leave here today because you're going to encounter Jesus, and you're going to encounter hope. You're going to leave here with hope. How do I know? Let me tell you, if you're taking notes, write this down. I know because hope already happened. Hope already happened. It happened when Jesus came out of that tomb. What a day that would have been to, for us to experience and see the stone rolled away. And my Jesus stepped foot out of the tomb. And as he stepped foot out of the tomb, he stepped foot on the throat of death, hell, and the grave and conquered it for you and for me. What a day. That's what today is all about. That's the hope that God offers you in this very moment today. Look at Hebrews 10, 23 in your notes and on the screen. Keep your place in 1 Peter 1. There's a lot more there. We'll get there. But Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Let us hold on to hope. Let us hold on unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. You ever met a faithless person? You ever been a faithless person? Maybe you are today. I've got a word for you. You want a word? The word I want to give you is that even when you're faithless, he remains faithful. He who promises hope is faithful even in a faithless world, even in a hopelessly broken world. He's faithful and he cares about you. Let's hold on to him. Let me give you the bottom line. Bottom line today, I always try to give a bottom line of what's the day about, what's the passage truly about. And this one really tells me to do two things. Holding on to hope means it takes a tight grip and open hands. You say, how do you do both? That doesn't make sense. That's counterintuitive. You can't do two things. Well, first of all, you have two hands. Second of all, I think this passage shows us what we need to cling to, what hope we need to hold on to. But it's going to show us a few different ways that we need to let go of some things and open ourselves up to some things that God has for our lives. That's what this passage is going to show us. I want us to look at that, a tight grip with one hand, yet open hands as well. Let's look at those two things. That's my point today is those two things. Tight grip. Let's start there. Number one, a tight grip is all about an eternity issue. Write that down if you're taking notes. Tight grip is all about an eternity issue. We just read verse 3, and it says that we have a living hope because Jesus is alive because of his resurrection from the dead. Verses 4 and 5 tell us some more about this tight grip on eternity. Let's look there. 1 Peter 1, verses 4 and 5. It says, To an inheritance, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Sounds kind of eternal to me. Sounds like that living, ongoing, never-ending hope to me. 
is kept in heaven for you. Who, verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Hold on to the things that are eternal. Hold on to the things that are not temporary. Hold on to the things that are unfading, the things that last, the things that go beyond your bank account, the things that go beyond your relationships, the things that go beyond to all those temporary things that you grab hold of and I grab hold of so often in our lives. Hold on to those things. Who squeezed on, by the way, to the hope of your wealth before? And then your bank account got low. Can I get an Amen. How many of you have ever held on to a job or career as your hope and something changed? Situations don't look now like they used to then. Maybe you've held on to a relationship and that was the hope that you clung to in your life and that relationship crumbled. Somebody decided to go a different direction. And the relationship you thought would never go away, it ended. And as you held on to that hope, you watched it ripped from your hands. Some of you held on to the hope that the church could offer you. A lot of people think that the church is the hope of the world. I've heard that phrase a lot in church. The church is the hope of the world. No, it's not. Have you ever met the church? Who's the church if you know Jesus? Do you think you're the hope of the world? If so, then we might as well just go home. If I'm the hope of the world, you're in trouble. I'm telling you the hope of the world is Jesus. He is the hope of the world. But let me say a word to you. If you've lost faith in the church, I love having people in our building sometimes that maybe you've lost faith in the church in your life and you've been hurt there before. People have let you down there before. I always say this. What do you think the number one thing is that people say? Well, I quit going to church because the church is full of? Yes. Say it louder. This is your chance to say hypocrites in church. It's full of? Yes. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. You know what I always say? Come join us. One more won't hurt. Now that I've offended half the room, <laughs> let me tell you what I mean by that. You're right. The church is full of hypocrites, including me. Paul said, of all the sinners, I'm the worst. I feel that way. You've met people that say one thing and do another. I've had a pastor let you down before. I want you to know I'll let you down. I struggle just like you do. I feel hopeless some days. You feel hopeless some days. But let me give you the statement that changed my life. I used to at times define my hope that I placed in the church based on the actions of God's people. So here's what I'll tell you. True hope bases faith on Jesus, on Jesus, on Jesus. True hope bases faith on Jesus, not the actions of his people. Amen. You're holding on to the wrong umbrella sometimes. True faith, true hope puts all of your faith in Jesus, not in his people doesn't mean you don't have faith and you lose hope in people. No, I've met amazing people. This room is filled with amazing people who are holding on to Jesus. But hold on to Jesus, and then when you find people who are holding on to him with you, then the church becomes an unstoppable force that will change the world. Amen. This is the defining statement that I use as a leader and a pastor. I want to be a part of the church because Jesus wants a part of me. This is the statement that defines who I am as a pastor and a leader. But more than that, and here's where it hits home for you and for me and for all of us, is that it's a defining statement for a follower of Jesus, no matter who you are, what role you play in the church. It's this, that Jesus is the hope of the world, but the church is the vehicle Jesus built to carry his hope to a hopeless world. You and I are that vehicle. We are called, we are compelled, we are created to carry the hope of the world who is none other than Jesus Christ to a world that is hopeless. That's what the church is supposed to be all about. I just wanted to share that with you because you may have lost hope in the church today because you gripped the wrong part. You gripped the wrong thing. Have you ever had your grips fail? I used to struggle with the fact that I thought I could lose my salvation that if I'm not good enough, you know, I, I prayed to receive Jesus at a young age, but if I'm not good enough, then I have this salvation in my hands, but it just like sand slips through my fingertips. You ever wondered about that? If you're honest, probably you would not, but you don't want anybody to see you. Like, I never wanted anybody to see, so I'm just going to tell you, I know in your heart some of you nodded today, and I want to tell you something about the grace of God. And if you want to jot down a passage to look at this week, write down John chapter 10, one of my favorite passages. John chapter 10, and it tells us there, it tells us there, oh, I love this. It tells us there 
that were in the palm of our Father's hand and that nothing, nothing can snatch us from the hands of our Father. I want you to know today in this place, I want you to leave knowing that if you gave your life to Jesus, yes, you will fail. Yes, you will feel hopeless. Yes, you will fall flat on your face. But I can, here's something else in your nose, I can get a grip on God's grace because God's grace is gripping me. You're not saved and you're not going to enter heaven because you gripped God's grace because your grip is not strong enough, but the grip of our Father, the grip of God's grace is always enough. And I can hold on to, I can have that hope, I can grip the grace of God because the grace of God is gripping me. He's got a hold of you. He wants you to get a hold, a grip on the hope that only comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. And so I ask you today, what is it that you've gripped onto, that you're holding onto? What umbrella have you grabbed? What's your grip like today? What have you gripped in your life? What do you truly hope in today? And I know the church answer is Jesus, but is it really Jesus? Is it really Jesus? Number two, this is where it gets a little more challenging for us, a tight grip that's an eternity issue, but verses 6 through 9 of 1 Peter 1 takes us to this concept of open hands, a tight grip, but also open hands, emptiness issue. You can write that down. Just like a tight grip is an eternity issue, holding on to things that last, this is an emptiness issue, this open hand issue, and it's kind of twofold. It means I've got to let go of some hopeless pursuits, and it means I've got to open up myself to God's plans for my life. We've said this a lot here at the church lately, and I truly believe that our emptiness is just evidence. I want you to know today, your emptiness is just evidence. Your emptiness is evidence of your readiness for God to provide and to do some amazing things in your life. When you're the most empty, there's a lot of evidence for God's readiness to do something big in your heart and your life. This passage shifts here from the eternity stuff, the unfading stuff, the salvation that awaits us to now an emptiness stuff, a letting go uh, right here and right now, more from the shift from the, pre the future to the present. And so that's what we will look at right now. Did you know, by the way, did you know that your beliefs about the future have everything to do with your actions in the present? Your beliefs about the future have everything to do with your actions, your behaviors, and your approaches, and your perspectives in the present. So that's what I want us to look at right now. Let's read verses 6 through 9 of 1 Peter chapter 1. It's the rest of the passage says in verse 6, in this you rejoice. We've been saying to rejoice is, re is a choice. To rejoice is a choice. It's a tough choice to make sometimes, but to rejoice is a choice. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, might be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, though you have not seen him, has God ever felt invisible to you? Maybe this passage has something for you today. If he feels invisible a million miles away, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Sounded like some open-handedness in that passage, some letting go in that passage. And I want to tell you today that there's two parts to this. Holding on to hope means letting go of hopeless pursuits, but it means opening up to God's agenda for my life. Holding on to hope means you've got to do two things, two hands to this equation of being open-handed. Give me, give me your hands real quick. Let me see. I see some palms. Looks like everybody bathed this morning. That's good. It means that I've got to let go of hopeless pursuits, the wrong umbrellas that I've got to grip on, but I've also got to be open-handed to receive God's agenda for my life. Both things need to happen in your life today. A lot of letting go. You can put your hands away now. A lot of letting go happens in our household. Anybody watched Frozen before? <laughs> let it go, let it go. Turn away and slam the door. Somebody say, the cold never bothered me anyway. If you didn't watch Frozen, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but maybe you will now. <laughs> Let's talk about letting go. Let's talk about what it means to let go. And 
what I want to mention to you is a lot of times letting go starts with finding things to hold on to that make a difference. Some of you have been holding on to some hopeless pursuits. <laughs> you know what this is? This is a representation of you <laughs> and me when we hold on to the wrong, wrong things. We walk around and we get a grip on non-eternal issues. We get a grip and we hold on to hope. We hold on to things that are never going to be effective, that are never going to be eternal, that are never going to matter. And they let us down and we feel like we're down and we feel hopeless because we're holding on. We've got a grip on non-eternal things. Our tight grip is on something that's not going to last. And we need to become open-handed and let go of hopeless pursuits to hold on to the wrong pursuits, to hold on to hopeless things is like taking this into a monsoon of rain. You're going to get wet. You're going to get wet. Some of you came in today and you feel like you're soaking wet with hopelessness. It's time to wring yourself out, get rid of the hopelessness, get a grip on the true hope. Let go of the hopeless pursuits in your life. Get rid of them and get a grip on eternity. Get a grip on the things that matter. Get that tight grip, but it, that tight grip only happens when you become open-handed. That tight grip on eternal things can only come into play when you let go of hopelessness and you open yourself up to what God has for your life. Today, I want us to talk about being open-handed for a moment now. I love in verse 6, it says we're grieved. We're grieved by various trials. But that also says before that, it says that we're guarded, that our salvation is guarded. Let me tell you today, some of you have lost someone. Some of you are grieved by problems. Some of you are literally grieving the loss of people in your life today. I want you to know, I want you to know that you're guarded in your grief. If you know Jesus, you're guarded in your grief. You're in the palm of your Father's hand. And even when you let go of and even when you grab hold of all the, right, the wrong things in your life, you're not surprising your father. He's still guarding you. He's still guarding your faith. He's still guarding your salvation. Even when you latch on to the wrong things, you're guarded in your grief. God loves you. Somebody came here on an Easter Sunday expecting a profound message, but the message you're going to leave with is this. God loves you. Some of you don't believe it. And it tears my heart out to think that somebody could leave this place not knowing that God truly loves them and that he cares about you where you are because he does. You're not too far gone. You don't have too many skeletons in your closet. God's bigger than the problems and the situations you face. He's not done with you. He has not discarded you like a broken umbrella. But it's time you throw away the broken umbrellas of your life and hold on to him who is the only, the only source of hope that you'll ever find. Be open-handed to him today, and I believe he'll bless you. Through your brokenness is going to come a blessing. Through your brokenness is going to come a blessing in this place today. Even when your situation is struggling, the essence of hope really is being able to face the facts. I'm not saying ignore the fact that life is tough. The essence of hope is facing the facts, but not letting the facts define your faith. The essence of hope is knowing that faith keeps my hopes up when my situation is going down. Faith keeps my hopes up when my situation is going down. Some of your situations are pretty dire and it's going down, but faith will keep your hopes up in this place today. You don't have to feel faith to have it. That statement changed my life years ago because I used to define faith by how I felt. Hear me again. You don't have to feel faith to have it. You don't have to feel faith to have it. But when you have faith, even when it's hard to feel it, when you trust and you have that tight grip on eternity, Yet an open hand to receive what God has for you and letting go of the things that don't matter, that's when faith will even be felt at times. But feelings go up and down. The fact still remains that Jesus is hope, the eternal person of hope. Christ in you is the hope of glory, the Bible tells us. That doesn't depend on your feelings or your situations. 
There's an eternal hope at stake here. There's an earthly hope here. I'm going to give you one more statement that's going to help you this week. Hold on to hope. I believe that to hold on to hope when all I see is struggle, I must give more weight. I must give more weight to what God said than what I see. To hold on to hope when all I see is struggle, I've got to give more weight to the promises of God than the problems in my life. To truly hold on to hope, I've got to put more emphasis on what God said than what I see. And that is hard to do. That's why I like verses 8 and 9. It talks about the unseen. It says it twice. Though you have not seen him, you love him. We love him because he first loved us. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him. Emphasis again. There's going to be times where it's hard to see him. That's the essence of faith. A lot of times we think the opposite of faith is doubting. Well, you don't have faith because you're doubting God. No. According to the Bible, the opposite of faith is seeing. The opposite of faith is sight. We wouldn't need faith if we could see everything. Faith is found in the unseen. Faith is found when we still have hope and we hold on to hope even when we don't see what God's up to in our midst. Sometimes God's going to stir something in you and say a change is coming, but you won't see evidence of that change for a while. I believe a lot of times that's because God doesn't want us to put the weight of our hope in the change itself, but put the weight, the full weight of our hope in Jesus who's going to bring about the change. Even before the change happens. Even before you see evidence of it. Even before you feel it, you know he's working, you know he's there, and you put the weight of your hope there, and it's more about what he said than what you see. Paul says it this way. If you ever feel like the facts of your situation, the failures of your life, or maybe the feelings in your life seem to outweigh your hope, because that happens a lot, doesn't it? They seem to weigh a lot. Some of you are carrying around a big, heavy backpack full of weight, of feelings and facts and failures in your life. Paul says it this way, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. You can jot that down, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Paul says, so we do not lose heart. Look at me for a minute. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're facing. Don't lose heart. Don't give up because God's not giving up on you. Paul says, don't lose heart. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light, 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 momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight, an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. They come and they go. They're up and they're down. They're temporary. For the things that are, uh, that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So we do not lose heart. We put more weight on what God said. We put more weight on the promises of God than the problems of our life. Romans 12, 12 says, Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Rejoice in hope. Patient in, con- in tribulation and constant in prayer. How do you hold on to hope? You let go of hopeless pursuits. You open yourself up to God's agenda for you. And you cling tightly. Get a tight grip on eternity. Get a tight grip on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Today, I have hope in the fact that hope already happened. Hope happened when Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave with you and mine. When Jesus conquered your sin. My hope is in a person. It's not in a thing. Hope is a person, and his name is Jesus. Hope already happened. And I say this a lot, and I want you to hear this loud and clear, because some of you have been battling for victory, battling to reach Jesus, battling to know that you're good enough to make it to heaven. I want you to hear me loud and clear. You will never, ever be good enough apart from Jesus. But you've been fighting for victory. Hear me. You've been fighting for the victory, but that victory was already won because hope already happened. Stop fighting for for victory, start fighting from victory. Because Jesus already won it. Religion says change and you can join us. Jesus, grace, says join us and I'll change everything. Stop reaching for God. You're not going to be able to reach. He already reached down to you through a person of Jesus Christ. He already won the victory. I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads for a minute. Close your eyes. Just think on what that means for you. What does it mean? 
What does it mean to know that Jesus has already won the victory? If you're a believer today, maybe you've been holding on to some things that you need to let go of. Maybe it's time to open yourselves up to some new agendas that God has for your life. But I want to talk especially to those of you who might say to me in this moment that I came here today feeling hopeless. I came here today hoping, hoping that maybe I could make it to heaven. But you would look at me right now and say, Pastor, as much as I'd like to say I know I would spend eternity in heaven with God through Jesus Christ, I have a personal relationship with Him because I know Jesus, I just don't know that I do. I just don't know that I have that solidified and nailed down. And some of you have been saying, well, I'll get that right one day. One day. One day may never come, and one day might be one day too late. So don't wait any longer. God's stirring in your heart, and I want you to know salvation is not about a prayer. A lot of times we Say it's all about how we pray something. I'm not even going to lead you in a prayer, in fact, because it's not about the words. It's about your heart. Your heart is already in this moment, I truly believe it, is already screaming to Jesus. The author, the finisher of your faith, you want to cling to that hope, and I want to challenge you, take that leap of faith. You'll never be good enough or get things cleaned up enough to get there. Just join Jesus, and he'll change everything. That doesn't mean your situation is going to look any prettier. Doesn't mean life's going to get easier. It may get harder. But you have hope no matter what rain comes your way. Salvation, according to the Bible and according to Jesus himself, is as simple as acknowledging, believing Jesus paid a price you could never pay on that Friday that we just celebrated. The reason it's good, he paid the price you could never pay because he lived a sinless life that you could never live. And he was that sacrifice on that cross as he hung there bleeding and broken for you because of his brokenness you can be made whole he paid that price for you while he was on the cross you were on his mind and then believe that he is alive that he didn't stay in that grave he walked out of that tomb and he's seated at the right hand of God now and present among us through his Holy Spirit and it's about trust it's about simply saying I've been trying to save myself but I can't do it anymore. I'm not good enough. I'm going to stop trusting me to save me. I'm going to start trusting you, Jesus, to save me. Salvation begins where you end. Lay yourself down today. You may say, well, I can't say it like you just did. God doesn't want you to say it like I just did. He wants you to say it from your heart. And through your heart being turned to him, you will be saved in this place today. Will you cry out to him just in your own heart right now in this moment?